Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. Today we're going to start exploring the concept of God in covenant with mankind. We will look at Old Testament and New Testament examples to see what these covenants contain. So Alton, where would you like to start? Well, you know, it's nice to know where you stand with somebody and anytime two people or groups of people want to have an understanding between them, they'll have some kind of a contract. And you will state what you will do and they will state what they're going to do to fulfill the contract. And it's nice to have something to hang your hat on so you know where you stand. And of course God knew this and he wanted to make sure we knew where we stood with him and what was expected of us and what we could expect of him. And, and uh, you know, it's nice to have boundaries. Some people don't like to give their kids boundaries, but, you know, when you give them boundaries, they feel safer. They know where they, and they'll try to challenge the boundaries. And, but, you know, any contract is only as good as the people's character who signed it or shook hands, whatever they do to um, seal the deal. And so we have to understand that covenants are great things, but they have to jump off the page or whatever they're written on and be a reality. So, you know, a lot of times we memorize a lot of uh, scripture, and that's great. It's good to know it. But then you got to implement it. You don't really believe it until you actually do it. And so, um, you know, one of the first wasn't exactly a covenant, so to speak, but it was a promise that God made Eve that she would be saved through childbearing. And that spoke to her of her seed, you know, talking about it, crushing the other guy's seed. And so that all came down to Jesus. That was the culmination of that promise. And so, um, but the first mention of the word covenant in, in the Old Testament is in Genesis 6, 18, when God said to Noah, he said, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, and thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So he made a covenant, and like a lot of the covenants, there came an ark out of it. So this ark was going to be the, the uh, way, the, the method by which he was going to save them. And so we know we have to understand some things. We read these things, and in, in, they're in the past, and they happened. And so, but if you were there and doing it, Okay, first off, it had never rained. And so the idea of a flood was like very foreign. And so when he, the Lord told him, You're gonna, I'm going to put you in this ark, he had to give him instructions. What to make it out of, how the dimensions of it, how to make the internal parts of it and everything. And... It took them 120 years to build it. And when you hand out a track to somebody, <laughs> just think somebody building an ark in the middle of the desert, and you come up to him and go, what are you doing? And he witnesses to you <laughs> that there's going to be a flood, and, and you just don't want to believe it. And, and that's what we're up against when we evangelize sometimes is we like to say things like Jesus saves and Jesus is the answer, and the people go, saved from what, and what's the question? Because they don't realize the trouble they're in or from Adam's nature being um, given to you at birth. That's your inheritance from Adam. 
it needs to be, you need to be disinherited from that. And so he told him to make it out of a wood, gopher wood. It's something that is incorruptible, okay? It won't rot. That's what he wants to do with us. He wants us to be incorruptible. Paul said this corruptible must put on incorruption. And then they put pitch on it. And if you look up the word for pitch, and they put it inside and out, it's not going to be just an outside thing where you're different inside. The inside was pitched, it was leak-proof, had watertight integrity, we called in the Navy. It's not going to leak. Well, you just hope that it doesn't spring a leak after the flood starts. So you have to have faith that God is telling you how to do it right. And you build it according to how he says to do it. And that word for pitch boils down to this word in Hebrew. The word kippur. Okay? Yom kippur, the day of atonement. So he's going to pitch you inside and out with atonement. And we're going to see this again later in some other arcs. And so he made an ark to save life. And, you know, a lot of people, they made a movie about Noah and uh, what's his name? Russell Crowe didn't want to be the actor because he said, I wouldn't be able to... Mm, shut the door on people when they're dying out there. People need to read the Bible. <laughs> Noah didn't close the door. God closed the door. He gave him 120 years, and then he said, okay, the door is shut. You'll see it again in Peter's epistle that Jesus went down and preached to those people. So I don't know, don't want to start some kind of weird doctrine, but why would he preach to them if there was no hope? It says they were, they were unbelieving and disobedient in the day of Noah. So um, Jesus hadn't come on the scene yet as a Savior. And so we'll just leave it at that for now. Then he made another covenant with Noah when they got off the ark. He put the rainbow in the sky and said we're not going to do this flooding the whole earth anymore so you can count on that we have floods here and floods there but it's not the whole earth and so you know when God makes a covenant he holds up his end of it if there's any breaking of the contract it's always on our part okay we we decide we're not going to go there, that route anymore or, or we don't take it serious enough and let it kind of slide and you know God will, God will hold up his end of the covenant to the ends of the earth and we'll see that as we go along in this study um, the, the next covenant we see is, is with Abram okay and he said, uh, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, they've been squabbling over Israel having this little strip of land over the centuries. But God gave them from the river of Egypt, which I believe is probably the Nile, to the river Euphrates, which is over in Iraq. And so Jordan and all, you know, Syria and all this stuff that's in between, that's what he gave them. But they never went in and possessed it. God's given us a lot of stuff, but we have to possess it. When you talk about the land, think of your self, your body, your life, all these different things. There's giants in there. Sin is trying to say you, you can't overcome me but God's saying with me you can overcome it and so he wants you to possess this land he told Israel little I'm not going to kick those people out all at once because somebody has to be on that land to keep it from going wild 
But as you're able to possess it, I will give it to you, and I'll send hornets in there to drive them out. I don't care if you have a Sherman tank. Hornets are going to drive you out. <laughs> God has a way of doing what he wants to do. And, and because he said from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates, that shows what he wants to do with us. He wants to take us from bondage, which we start out in sin, and take us to the river Euphrates. That's called the Fertile Crescent over there between the Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And that word Euphrates, one of its meanings is fruitful, like Ephraim. Okay, and so uh, he wants to take us from from bondage to being fruitful, to being something that that uh, produces something good. And so, when you think about that, he wants to give us. That's his covenant. He wants to give us ourself back, and then. You take yourself and put it on the altar and say, I'm a living sacrifice. I'm your servant and, and command me to do your bidding and your will. And, and you know, sometimes we think that's a, that's a bondage, but it isn't. Paul said he was a prisoner, but he was a prisoner of something good. He was glad that God had taken him out from where he was and brought him into where he became and he produced here we all are sitting because of largely because of people like Paul and so he, he told Abraham I'm gonna multiply you first he said like the sand of the sea that's Israel in the natural then he said like the stars of the sky that's us Israel was a prototype he had to make it work in something and then expand it and that's how he wanted to do it and so he gave them uh, as a token as a something to prove to have a covenant instead of signing it to something he had circumcision that's a little more permanent and it requires a pretty serious commitment when you think about it and so he uh, this was this circumcision was going to be a token or a signal, or a flag, or a beacon, or a monument, or evidence, or a mark, okay, that you had this circumstance, that you were in this covenant, okay? And uh, if you go to uh, Colossians 2.11, it says, it's talking about Jesus, it says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And it says you're buried with him in baptism. Okay? And so you're raised to a newness of life. You come into, a, into this new covenant. And we'll talk about that as we go along. But right now I'm going to hand it over to my lovely wife and see what she has to say about all this. Thank you, honey. So yes, God remembered the covenant that he had made with Abraham. And as we move forward into Exodus chapter 2, let's look at what happened when God brought Israel out of Egypt, brought them out of bondage. If we were to go to Exodus 2 and verse 23... Let's pick up with that. And it happened after many days the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of their bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Verse 24, And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Verse 25, and God looked upon the sons of Israel and God knew, that word means acknowledge, consider, and answer. He answered their cry. Then if we were to move a couple of chapters forward into Exodus 6, we see again the concept 
of covenant being forwarded. It says, I will establish my covenant with them, that would be Israel, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their travels in which they traveled. And then fast forwarding down to Exodus 19, the mention of covenant, covenant here. And now, if you will obey my voice indeed, God is speaking to Israel, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure. That's all one word, peculiar treasure, that's been translated into English. One Hebrew word that means wealth. Not just wealth that's, that's exploited or shown about, but wealth that is closely shut up. Think about very, very rare, expensive jewels. Those are kept where? They're not kept on the kitchen sink. They're kept in a safe. They're guarded. They're protected. They are closed up for protection. You will be to me those jewels, those valued, treasured, protected, guarded jewels. You will be to me the jewels to be above all nations, for all the earth is mine. If we look at Psalms 135, we see this mention again of peculiar treasure. Psalm 135 verse 4 says, For Jehovah has chosen Jacob to himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Then back in Exodus chapter 24 verse 7, And he took the book of the covenant and read it to the audience of the people, Moses did. And they said, in response to the book of the covenant, the words that were written, all that the Lord has said, that we will do and be obedient. So they voiced their agreement, their signature, to this covenant with God in chapter 24, verse 7. They agreed to keep their end of the covenant. As Alton said, God never drops his covenant with man. It's always the other way around. Man walks away from his covenant and his agreement. And we're going to see that it didn't take too long for Israel to renege on what they said, but that's for another time. If we were to pick up verse 8 in chapter 24 of Exodus, Moses took the blood after the people of Israel said, all that the Lord has said, that we will do and be obedient. Then verse 8, he says, and Mo it says, And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. So the sprinkling of the people with blood was a sign that the this, this sealing was a sealing of that covenant. They had been sanctified. They'd been set apart. They had been, their their agreement had been sealed to this covenant. So here's the beautiful thing: the old covenant was sealed with the sprinkling of blood of animal blood. But we go to John chapter six and look at the new covenant. John six fifty six says this. He who partakes, he who ingests my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. And so we have a whole different level of commitment being made in the New Testament with not the sprinkling of blood outwardly, but the partaking of the blood of Jesus. And of course, we think about communion when we do that. It's in remembrance of his blood and our agreement of taking his salvation through his blood that we see in the New Testament. But back in Exodus, let's look at verse 28 of chapter 34, Exodus 34, 28. And he said, he, and he was there with the Lord. Moses had gone up into the mountain, into Mount, the, the mountain to commune with the Lord. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. And he did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon, God wrote upon with his own finger, the tablets of stone. He wrote the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Verse 29 of chapter 34, Exodus continues. And it came to pass, beautiful thing here, it came to pass after 40 days in the presence of God Almighty. 
he came down the mountain with the two tablets of testimony. And when he came down the mountain, Moses didn't know that his face shined with the glory of God, radiated with the glory of God. Now think of it. A man is in the presence of God in the top of the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Of course there was an impact made even on his physical body. His face shone. He didn't know his face was shining when he came down the mountain. But that was the evidence, the manifestation of the presence of God. So I want, we won't go in any further into that concept, but we'll pick it up later on. But as we were preparing this, this new study on covenant, it was interesting. We were, we were listening to a minister that we, we listen to on occasion and respect, and he made this statement. The timing of it was perfect because of our beginning of this study of covenant. He said, the king is going to dress his bride in dazzling garments and put upon her radiant holiness. Think about, again, Moses coming out of the presence of God after 40 days, his face shining. I believe we are moving into an era when the king will present his glorious church to the world in remarkable ways. The maturing ecclesia, or as many say, ecclesia, will stand for the word of God. This is the governing part of the body of Christ. Will stand for the word of God, follow truth, and walk in his ways, just as covenant was originally set up, that it's an agreement between man and God. God doesn't move away and ignore his part of the covenant. But if man will not follow the covenant, then man reaps the benefits, should say, reaps the bad, the bad effects of that breaking of covenant. So he says, we'll follow truth and walk in the ways of God. A church will rise above a liberal, progressive, hybrid gospel, one filled, a church filled with born-again heirs who will do the same works as Jesus. This church will be unashamed and will stand and embrace covenant relationship with the King of Kings at levels that we have never seen before. And so this was a prophetic proclamation that was made that fit, again, even just the timing that we were beginning to study and research this concept of covenant. And I believe that this, this man is hearing from God that the, the church, the governing body of Christ is going to rise up in radiance, not our own righteousness, not our own glory, but reflecting the glory of God and showing forth who he is on the earth in the days to come at levels that have never been seen before because covenant will be carried out. Covenant will be honored between God and man. And his, his head, the head, Jesus Christ, the head of the body, being joined together with the body to move in unison and to fulfill the purpose that the church was even designed for in the beginning. So we trust that this today has been an encouragement and a blessing to you. We send our love to you in Jesus' name. God took his people through the wilderness, takes the wilderness out of his people, the giants in They saw his wonders and mighty acts Who could argue with a God like that? Caleb 
gave the report There is plenty to eat An abundance of fruit Abundance of meat God required that day That his people see That in the land of giants There's victory God took his people through the wilderness And takes the wilderness out of his people The giants in our land cannot withstand The overcoming power of Christ Places in us that were barren and dry He's replacing with his river of life God took his people through the wilderness And takes the wilderness out of his people Covered by cloud, protected by fire They walked onto the promised land In these days his glory and praise Will be our canopy of defense A pavilion of safety by night and day A place of refuge from the storm As we possess our inheritance now His holy fire burns in our hearts God took his people through the wilderness and takes the wilderness out of his people The giants in our land cannot withstand The overcoming power of Christ Places in us that were barren and dry He's replacing with his river of life God took his people through the wilderness takes the wilderness out of his people and takes the wilderness